Hi everyone, welcome to this session on shaking up the culture of research assessment. My name is Lucy Walton and I am part of the group that's organising an Open Access Week this year in Australasia. So just a few logistics before we start. We will be recording this session and posting it on the website along with the slides. Uh, so please keep your microphones muted and turn your cameras off unless you are speaking. Uh, please type your questions into the chat and we will read these out and respond at the end of the session. We should be finished on or just before the hour. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'd like to invite you to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands on which you live and work in the chat. So just a little about this session. The panel will be discussing how we should be thinking about changing the culture of research assessment, including how reform could support a change to more open research practices. This talk will be recorded and made available on the Open Access Australasia website. And so with that, I'll hand this session over to, over to Dion Detera and Emma Burrows. Thank you, Lucy. I'm a mid-career researcher and I joining, I'm joining you from beautiful Wurundjeri country uh, here in Melbourne. Dion is an early career researcher and the two of us um, met when we co-organised an Australian-wide conversation earlier this year to design a new system of rewards for STEM professionals. Um, we are both thrilled to chair today and I'm just going to pass over to Dion to set the scene. Hi, so I'm calling in from Garrick and Gundagara country. Um, I'm in the Blue Mountains. Um, and one of the thoughts that I've had around this topic is that the situation that we currently that we currently find ourselves in is one where we have these narrow metrics that silo our work. Uh, what we tend to observe though is that real innovation comes from thinking outside of these frameworks. Uh, but there is very much a global movement afoot. Um, and a concrete example of that is that in the Netherlands, they've just dropped the impact factor. So today, of course, we're delving into the Australasian context of this bigger global movement. And so we've assembled three wonderful speakers with that perspective. Emma. So to introduce our wonderful speakers, thank you, Dion. Um, Kimberly Weatherall is a professor of law at the University of Sydney and specialises on issues at the intersection between law and technology. She recently co-authored an insightful paper on bad metrics in the law with her colleague, Rebecca Giblin, and we're really looking forward to her insights today. Our second speaker, Tara McLaren, is Head of Research Development at the Telethon Kids Institute in Perth and Chair of AMRI Research Impact Framework Report. This framework was co-designed with 32 medical research institutes and shifts the narrative of what activities and indicators we deem impactful. And lastly, Robert Malhammer is a professor of linguistics at Western Sydney University, investigating the traces of the past in human languages. He joins us from both sides of research assessment and will also share his insights from an institutional level. So to go to you, Robert, first, as you sit on both sides, the assessed and the assessor, what does good research assessment look like to you? Um, thanks for the question, Emma, and um, great to be here. Thanks for organizing this. Um, um, can I can look at this from the perspective of the researcher, as you say, and also the perspective from of the institution as the chair of the professorial leadership group and as a former associate dean research. 
Um, so one thing that we've noticed and that what, what, what I've tried to develop in our school in particular is um, the close relationship between um, disciplinary practices and forms of assessment. Because especially in the humanities, we noticed that the uh, metrics that were given to us, um, impact factors and the like, didn't fit with what the practices were in the, in the relevant um, disciplines, particularly with respect to non-traditional outputs. And that were, there was a risk, a strategic risk, that we would miss the mark in peer review disciplines if we were going with uh, indicators of quality that weren't fit for purpose. So um, for me, um, this, this design of, of criteria that reflected what was actually the practice in um, the disciplines was the key thing. So good assessment, my answer would be, it's got to reflect what the disciplines value uh, in terms of quality. So it has to be on the ground, otherwise we're gonna miss the mark. There is indeed a mismatch, I think, in many disciplines. Thank you for sharing, Robert. Um, Kimberly, you've written a really fantastic paper from your perspective in the legal profession. Can you share some insights of your field and potentially how um, it has evolved to use metrics in a, in a different way? Yeah, that, uh, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. It is delightful to be here. Um, and Robert, I really like your framing around values and the values of the discipline, because I think that's really critical to how we do research impact assessment. And that was informing Rebecca and my work when we started looking at this. Um, we wanted to look at how you could do things like impact assessment in law um, as another form of associate dean research and someone who had to put together an impact um, material for the ARC's process. This was close to my heart. Um, and when we looked into it, we, we did find that the law and disciplines engagement with metrics was, was pretty disastrous. And we tried to rank journals. It was a dismal failure. Uh, citations, as soon as you look at things like citations, they perform a very different role in law from the way that they perform in STEM. Um, citation is not always a measure of engagement approval or that you're building on work. It can be because you disagree. Um, and all of our citations aren't even captured by the major systems because our journals aren't captured because we have so many and they're all published by a very diverse set of publishers. So all of the metrics looked bad for us. And then when we thought about um, measures of impact, we were even more concerned, if anything. Um, we delved into you know, some of the obvious measures of impact that you could have in law, something like, say, citation by courts. I mean, it sounds like exactly the kind of impact that you might want to have as a, as a legal researcher, but um, it's, as a measure, it's highly skewed. It's skewed towards particular kinds of research, doctrinal and descriptive work, certain areas of law, like constitutional and public law. And um, a researcher down at the University of Melbourne, Katie Barnett, Professor Katie Barnett, um, did some work on the high court citations and found the most appalling gender division. It was like 10% women, 90% men. I mean, it was, it was really quite, it was really that bad and quite eye-opening. And then you look into other measures of impact, like media mentions, they have gender biases and exclude a whole range of um, different underrepresented groups. Conferences and panels have similar issues. And then we thought about potential measures of mentoring and leadership, like how many PhDs have you supervised or um, how often have you co-authored um, with your PhD students? And a lot of these measures are very bad. For example, co-authorship is not a usual uh, measure in law. It's not usually done. If it is done, then potentially it might be done for the wrong reasons if you make that a measure. Um, you know, the number of the people that you might supervise, you know, you don't want to massively increase that number because that means you're probably giving quite poor supervision to all of those students you have. So, you know, you start to look into this and it just gets more and more worrying. So when we wrote the chapter, it was like, well, we wanted to suggest some alternative ways of thinking that would build in our values as legal researchers and asking questions differently. So asking, instead of asking, what is your impact? Asking what have you done with your discovery? What have you done about your discovery? What have you tried to do with it? Not how are you a leader or how many people have you supervised, but what have you done to enable the work of others? Being that sort of mentoring and leadership question. And all that was about encouraging researchers to have their own narrative about what impact they want um, their work to have, how they've gone about trying to make it happen and who they're lifting and helping along the way. 
So, yeah, metrics metrics are challenging. <laughs> metrics are extraordinarily challenging. And the minute you start looking into them, they look worse even than you thought. Hi. Um, so, Tara, um, you come from the mental side of STEM uh, and your work with AMRI, which is the peak body representing medical research, that work shifts the narratives around how we define impact uh, quite considerably. Uh, how would, you, uh, would, would you be able to tell us about the research impact framework and also how it helps to reform research assessment? Thanks, Dean. I'd love to. Um, and thanks for having me here as well. And another nice segue from Kimberly to me is talking about shifting the conversation and changing the narrative about impact. So this was a primary focus of our project. So this project was actually very generously funded by the Ian Potter Foundation and was a project that ran over two years where we developed a research impact framework for the health and medical research sector. Um, it's been a fantastic project. When we started, we had um, big ambitions of, of sort of coming right down the end point to what practices organisations were embedding to actually see how they supported research impact, which I think is some of the work that Kimberley's alluding to their doing in their faculty. However, we realised that we were much earlier in our research impact journey than actually having a good understanding of best practices. So we actually shifted our project to actually look at developing a framework that used a common language because we found that people were using different words to describe their research impact. So we stepped right back and we decided to do a Delphi process um, inviting members of the um, health and medical research community. So not only MRIs, but also funders um, and government bodies to participate in a project to look at categories of research impact and then indicators underneath. So we actually based our work on the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences Research Impact Framework and we came up with six categories for research impact. So the three traditional ones that you would see in the ARC or the NH and MRC which are social, economic and health impacts. Also knowledge impacts which exists in the NH and MRC research impact uh, framework but not in the ARC and then we also had advancing knowledge and research capacity building um, which were really highly regarded by the research sector as contributions that research makes to our communities. Uh, so we went through that process and through a three-round Delphi process um, we did confirm that they were definitely things that were important to the whole sector and we came up underneath with a number of indicators that you can use to show that you're on the journey to research impact. So in health, economic and social impact, uh, the indicators defined the endpoint, so the impacts that have been achieved as a result of your research. But in advancing knowledge, research capacity and informing decision making, it's the research activities that occur along your pathway that are going to indicate that you are undertaking the right activities to ensure that, that the research that you're undertaking is actually going to lead to an impact. So we came up with a number of indicators. Um, when we talk about it, we talk about, um, it's a little bit like a lolly shop. It's a little bit like you have your, your pocket money and you're going in with your 50 cents or however much it is these days to buy um, a bag of mixed lollies. And these are indicators that all organizations came to a consensus, which was 80% or more that these indicators should be included. Now for us, that's quite important because we want to use a set of indicators that are not conflicting across the sector. So we don't want one organization to be collecting a sector, an indicator which is slightly parallel or adjacent to another indicator. So we're trying to really streamline this for the sector. However, we're not, pre we're not prescribing which indicator should be used for which disciplines, which projects or which funders. So really we're providing this as a platform to enable a shared conversation about which indicators are important and also help guide the sector towards um, coming up with common platforms for collecting some of these indicators. So that's been the project to date. Uh, we are looking forward to rolling it out. So we are developing a community of practice 
um, through the medical research, the AMRI, the Australian Association of Medical Research Institutes, where we are going to talk, start talking to some organisations about how they're going to apply the framework in practice. And we've also already got a couple of really great examples where organisations have been applying the framework to funding, to promotions, to setting their strategies. And as we get more of these case studies, we'll be able to share them with the sector, um, hopefully our, our successes as well as some, some failures or learning so that we can learn together as a sector. Sarah, you and I have spoken before about this framework and it's a lot of work. And I love the fact that it marries a lot of different disciplines because STEM is very diverse, but we've got two people here from more disciplines and we we are in Australia, Australasia, we, there are lots of people who are part of this conversation. This is not just a STEM conversation. Um, I just wanted to bring everyone to the big question. A lot of people, even though they're quite happy to have this conversation, some people, the naysayers will come in and say, well, look, that's a lot of work, right? How do we shift these people who are focusing on the burden of collecting these indicators um, the burden of looking through uh, an application that is narrative-based as opposed to condensing it down to a, a single number. I'll start with Tara, but I'm very keen to hear from different fields how we shift this burden uh, or at least the conversation away from um, the negative aspect of that. Absolutely. And I think that the first thing to actually um, start with is actually having the conversation about burden. So we have lots of conversations about burden internal to our organisation, which is, you know, walking this fine tightrope between, you know, rigour in our assessment processes and then burden on, on all parts of the system. And it's not just a matter of shifting the burden from, from the applicant to the reviewer or from the reviewer to the applicant. So I think it's really tricky. I think having standardised metrics is a start. Um, then we are collecting things as a matter of course in our in our everyday lives and we can repurpose those for for other activities. Um, we've interestingly enough, um, I had spoken to Emma previously who alerted me to the work in um, the Netherlands and we've just gone through the process internally of redefining one of our internal schemes to look at a narrative based CV approach, which is not based on your usual, usual traditional metrics, but allowing researchers to really paint the best picture of their track record relative to their field, relative to their opportunity and relative to their career stage. And it's been a very interesting process. So what we have found is researchers are not generally very experienced in writing in this way because it's slightly different from other grant applications. Um, we're also recognising that um, reviewers need to come along on the journey um, because there is a, a natural instinct when you are time poor to want to rank something numeratively or quantitatively. So it's been a process of sort of moving along that pathway. And um, I refer to a report that I've just read recently by, the, by Science Europe, Shaping the Future of Research. It's called Recommendations on Research Assessment Processes. It's a really good... Um, um, document if you have an opportunity to read it and it really talks about how important it is to train assessors in the way that you're changing assessment so it's not just a matter of changing an assessment process and then just assuming that your assessors are going to catch up and I think we've seen that with some of the um, NH and MRC scheme changes which is the scheme changes and the applicants changes and the reviewers change and this kind of this this middle middle ground um, and also calling out biases I think is is really important and some organizations do that really well um, and some organizations are at the beginning of their journey around this biases but I think the burden issue is real I think my my view being a research administrator is researchers should be spending their time doing research and so I have a, a conflict in, in researchers that spend 30, 40, 50% of their time writing research applications where the success rate may be 10 or 20%. Um, so I think we have to, as a sector, be moving towards something which retains the rigor and the ability to do proper qualitative peer review, but not so much that it adds burden onto the sector and creates more work. So I'd be interested in the thoughts of Kimberly and Robert um, being on the other side of the fence. <laughs> I have thoughts. <laughs> of course I have thoughts. Um, yeah, well, look, we thought about this too because we were advocating you know, for narratives and for people to shape their own narratives about their impact because, you know, the research is so diverse and because a lot of those standard forms of impact may not work for certain populations. Telling someone to be on Twitter is 
not necessarily great if that means they're going to get a lot of abuse. You know, so there are there are all sorts of challenges here, and look, they're not they're not easily resolved. Researchers do feel the burden, and I feel the burden constantly. But I think I think two 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 quick responses. Um, one is I absolutely one hundred percent agree with you about the need to train assessors, and particularly increasingly the need to train assessors across disciplines so that they can understand what the norms of a given discipline are. And I think there's a lot of role for um, the disciplines or the learned, learned academies and other organisations that are peak bodies in disciplines to actually have their own articulation. You know, like I really like the fact that you've work, you're working on that in the health and medical um, area. You know, I think in law, there are various sort of descriptions that researchers like me will try to put in our ARC applications, kind of explaining what publication means in our, in our field. You know, to the extent that we could have some standard language around that so we could train assessors more readily, you know, short summaries of this, it would be terrific. Um, and on the researcher side, with, with narratives, um, you know, you, you mentioned that you know, researchers may not be using may not be used to writing narratives in these kinds of ways. But again, the more we can be talking across the different places where we have to use these narratives, the better off we are. I mean, the reality is once you get to, say, a promotion stage, you are absolutely writing a narrative that tries to put the best face on your, um, you know, your career and what you've done and why you've done it and what impacts you've had. And the more we can repurpose those and keep using those across grant applications, across research assessment and across, you know, promotion applications, you know, it, there's, a, there's a lot of um, repurposing that can be done and a lot of time that you can win back by learning to do that well. So I think, you know, I think there are ways and I think there are ways that peak bodies and the disciplines could help. But, you know, ab and absolutely having the conversation about the burden, like, you know, being really upfront about, what we are willing to do and how much you know time we're willing to take out of researchers and administrators jobs in order to get you know that one percent more rigor to the system um i think one what, when we try to sort of look at these um criteria that we're developing for hfr code we quickly realized that impact is not the same as quality and and what we value in terms of um, how we how we measure high quality research isn't the same as measuring impact and impact isn't isn't the only indicator that we could use um, in fact whether something is impactful or not may not directly relate to how how good the work is so it turns out that obviously everybody has had this experience you send in a paper for review you get back three reviewers. One reviewer says, this is the best paper I've ever read. The second reviewer says, this is OK. The third reviewer says, unpublishable. You know, And, and that sort of points to the fact that in many disciplines, we don't really have um, explicit and formulated standards of what we think is good work. Um, and I think that's the sort of very often points to the sort of heart of the matter is make those criteria explicit to start with and say what is it that we value about good research you know what what, what is it you know so, so that two reviewers actually have the same opinion of the same of the same item and that means um we've got to go back to the start and look at the um look at our our own indicators and say what what would i like to see much as we look at our students work and go okay what are the standards and and, and criteria that we apply here um and, and i think if we had that to some degree, this would um, help us tremendously. If we had to submit, you know, like a, 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 our own marking sheet for our paper when we send it into a journal and say, okay, I've um, this is high quality because this is high this is high quality because I've done X, Y, and Z, rather than um, you know thinking about proxies like journal ranking and impact factors and and all the rest of it, just go straight to the heart and say, what is it about this work that makes this high quality? Um, and I think that would be tremendously, it would be very helpful and it would be a lot more objective because we could say these criteria are the criteria that are relevant to, let's say, linguistics or law or whatever, and then, or, you know, even subfield. And then, and then, and then, so I think not so, it, 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 getting the dimensions sort of uh, in, to include actual quality um, directly measured as uh, at, the, at the heart, sort of at the work. That would be real. That would be a real step forward. I think that would be a game changer. We try to do this in our school with 
FOR code based um, criteria for quality, but it's very hard. Um, it's it's a long term process, I think, and, and a conversation that should start now, I think. And I'm really glad Robert, that you mentioned quality because this is um, a core component of open science and we are talking about research assessment within this week. Um, I know Dion and I have had quite a lot of chats about being at the earlier stages of our career. So we talk about these um, narrative based assessments, we talk about defining impact, we talk about um, quality and, and even the sorts of practices that we need to build up and, and the skills we need to develop in order to be masters of these um, are things that we acquire of our career. Dion, did you want to talk to, you know, what it's like to be at the early to mid-career research level and, and have this conversation um, happening um, around us? Sure, sure. So uh, I'm currently a PhD candidate. Uh, but what I have observed is that and I think one of the points raised in the chat mentioned as well is that there's a lot of energy just expended in dealing with university rankings, making sure that uh, all the metrics are cleaned up and uh, just dealing with the scope of the whole thing. And I think it's really zapped the energy that uh, researchers have to do what they should be doing is research. So instead, there's an inordinate amount of time spent doing uh, these administrative tasks. And I think that the other point as well is that when you start setting impacts and targets, it's very easy uh, for the point of those things to be lost. So instead of being, uh, instead of us remembering that those targets are there for a reason, the targets become the reason. And that can really skew the research, which is actually another point I saw in the chat a minute ago. Um, so I think there's always a danger in formalization if it becomes too narrow and uh, too divorced from the territory that it's trying to map. Um, I was just wondering if any of the speakers had any thoughts on that in particular. <laughs> I think it's really tricky, Dion. I think I think if it was easy, somebody would have already put in a solution that we'd we'd all trying to jump on and 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 adopt. Um, I think I also think that putting I think Robert alluded to this earlier, but having having metrics and indicators in place can sometimes drive behaviour in a way that can end up being perverse, um, and you you've got your eye potentially on the wrong prize. And so I think there's that we have to be really mindful of the fact that we want to have a, a suite of of indicators or a suite of ambitions that we're trying to reach as a discipline, you know, and as a sector, but that we're not pigeonholing people into achieving certain things in order to be promoted. And I think that's a really difficult sort of tightrope to balance, um, you know, and, and the readings on qualitative versus quantitative assessment, you get, you get different values out of both, right? So quanti quantitative can be very black and white, but it can be very narrow and very biased qualitative assessment is is what we would consider um, you know a much better process but it is it's still open to subjective and objective biases and it's much more difficult for people to actually um, do, to undertake that um, we have been dealing with the issue of EMCRs at our organization and the expectations that we put in place for them and the support that we put in place for them so that they can help navigate that journey uh, where those where their journeys aren't all consistent because of various factors. And we, we certainly haven't got it right yet, but I think starting the conversation about that um, is really important. And, and getting feedback from people like yourselves who are, who are in the journey now. So we're not taking advice from people who may have been uh, through the process 10, 20, 30 
maybe even 40 years ago, um, to really make sure that we're keeping those people who are in their PhD or in the early mid-career space central to the conversation. Yeah, one of the things that um, we we did at Sydney a while back was try to try to actually start articulating standards at different levels, because the risk always with a lot of these measures is that you you kind of set the aspirational standard for a successful level E professor, and that that just sort of sits up there entirely divorced from the real lives of ECRs and MCRs, um, and so we did. Sp- spend a bit of time kind of trying to articulate like what might be the expectations at different levels to try and provide some of those guide some of that guidance now obviously the next thing we should do is talk to ACRs and MCRs about whether that works for them or not um, and I have to say I, can't, I that was you know beyond my time as ADR and I should probably go back and think about it um, I mean another thing that I just want to highlight from what Tara was just saying is that you know, I think, I mean, one of the good things about having stuff like thinking about impact actually come into the picture has been that it's highlighted that academics have different kinds of careers. Like some people do just want to sit and write books and that's fine, right? That's terrific. That's really valuable work. And some people don't. Some people want to be out in the community talking to lots of people and and doing things very much at the the coalface. And, you know, hopefully... Another thing that we tried to do was articulate like a whole lot of different things that a researcher might be successful on while, you know, highlighting in very big red letters at the top, we don't expect you to do all of this, right? There are, there are different ways of being a successful academic or a good academic and doing good work. And some of, you know, not everyone is going to have that same sort of career. So the more, the more messaging you can have around that, I think, and the more that you can make that actually a reality in things like promotion, the better off, you know, people are going to be sort of shaping a career that actually works for them um, and that is reasonable for their lives. Can I comment on that, Kimberly? Sorry, Robert, can I just comment on that one second? Um, I do a lot of work with, with EMCRs and talking about what their aspirations are for the future. So my role is head of research development. So lots of research and development and grant strategy. And I do find that um, researchers who are early to mid careers need to be really more, much more purposeful in, in the activities that they're going to in, engage in and undertake within the research sector. And I'm like, there is only one unicorn in the world that can look at Kimberly's list and actually tick off everything that she's got in the, in the you know, the massive ecosystem of things that you can, can contribute to. And as an EMCR, as you go through your journey, actually being much more purposeful about the type of researcher that you want to be and the activities that you want to undertake and the things that drive you passion and bring you joy and bring you success it's quite a hard step to navigate. And actually, if you've gone through a research process where you're a PhD student, you know, and then a very early postdoc working under direction, that can be quite difficult to navigate. Um, And so I think coming up with with exactly that list of things that you can contribute to in the research sector, which part of those are in our research impact framework, some of them didn't make it in because they had to reach a consensus and, and working in a very diverse health and medical ecosystem in Australia, they're not all in our framework, but actually understanding and saying, actually, my intention and my interest is to actually do lab-based work and mentor the next generation of highly technically skilled discovery researchers, or I want to do this work and I really want to engage with our communities and make sure that our communities are, you know, are, are involved in the research that we do. It can't necessarily do everything. So I think that's that's also something that EMCR should really proactively seek out is support to work out what are the things that are going to be important for their career. Right. Just want to go back to Diane's original question, which is kind of uh, why do why do why are we doing this? It, it doesn't this have the risk that we just game the system? And that it goes, you know, so that's why it's going to be uh, clearly um, grounded in the disciplinary um, practices. But the other thing, the other advantage that this has is it lets us, as Kimberly said, um, give give us different perspectives at research and highlight what we like to do and how we would contribute because we can make explicit why this is high quality. If we didn't have this, there would be so much subjectivity or there would be just the old, um, it w- it, there would be so much sub- subjectivity or there would be only one size fits all system that you had to go in um, and that would be something that would not not just subjective, but also curtail a sort of 
any alternative and, and stymie sort of innovation. If we can be explicit about what high quality research is, then we we'll realize that this comes in many different shapes and sizes. And if we do it right, and so that it reflects what quality actually is in the relevant discipline or field, we will discover that there are many pathways to excellent research. And that will then be um, increasing the access, the accessibility to research, and um, it'll it'll drive innovation. Um, and I think um, have, having making this explicit is what, what, what counts because if we don't make it explicit and if we don't make it clear what, what constitutes quality, um, we're left with a, with a system that's subjective and that's going to be driven by proxies. And then we start gaming the system and it's not gonna reflect high quality anymore. And then it's going to do the opposite of what it's supposed to be doing, namely helping us and helping us doing better research and, and, and finding new ways at, at arriving at high quality research. Uh, thanks, Robert. Um, one thought I just had while listening to all this is that the matrix uh, may be a way of codifying the discipline's culture. And so that involves rethinking the culture and looking at what works, what doesn't, the way it should be and the way it actually does function and thinking about how to codify it more effectively. And uh, that's maybe a, this is the way I thought it while well, uh, you were talking then. Um, uh, Emma, what are, you, what are your thoughts about that? I couldn't agree with, with you all more. Um, I think the thing that I keep coming back to is we've got, and in fact, this is an analogy that Kim, you used in your, your paper around um, a bad set of bacteria coexisting together um, in, our, in our sort of GI system. I love this analogy. Um, being a biologist, it really resonated. So if we have, if we have this sort of bad one that's really driving the culture, um, can we identify it? So we've got, we've got this big problem that we need to change the narrative. If we've got a lot of people that need to be in the room as well. So I know that this is a two-tier question. So is there one sort of bad bacterial culture you can think that it's driving the bad behaviour across our disciplines? And the second one is who? how do we get people in the room to discuss this, to, to bring the diversity, to ensure that we actually have that healthy ecosystem? Because if we don't have early to mid-career researchers, you fail to bring along the people that you need to train their behavior remains the same because they've been trained in the old system. So I, I'm not sure who would like to, to respond first. Kimberly, would you like to go? Because I know it's your analogy. I don't want to take credit for that. <laughs> um, yeah, it is my analogy. And, and, and our analogy was, was very much driven by the idea that you, you need to start out the healthy, the healthy gut microbiome um, and if you have that in place then it's much much harder to invade with the bad ideas and so it's but it was much it's much a, very much about deciding what is important for your discipline um, and then making sure that you just articulate that and you keep telling people that um, a, a good example of the bad the bad one was you know when the ARC did just decide to create a ranked list of law journals um, back in 2010, and they did it based on a US list, and it was just the worst thing. And the, wor the worst thing about it is it's been very, very difficult to get rid of since. It is still driving people, you know, 10 years down the track when it's been abandoned by the ARC and anyone sensible, um, you still see references to it. Uh, so highlighting again that that importance of the, the good bacteria. Um, look, it's it's... You know, as I say, like this has to be a disciplinary conversation and it has to be a disciplinary conversation that, that as you say, like includes people at all the levels. You know, again, the, the challenge I keep coming back to in this, of course, is, oh, God, burden, right? Because now we're talking about more training and we all know what happens when universities decide to impose more training on us, um, which is that it takes time and it takes effort. Um, so... One of the things that we talked about in the paper was the need to have, you know, conversations at, at every level. I think I think people like ADRs um, and the professional staff that they work with have a really, really important role 
in this because it's there that you can do the best help and the best training of people and the best that best one-on-one -on -one help where you're helping a person try to find which lollies in the research jar they want um and you know from there up like you know i think the disciplinary peak bodies council of australian law deans in my discipline has has an important role to play here but i should not try and dominate the conversation no, I think what you're saying is the conversation is the critical thing. It's a culture shift that we need because very often we have sort of a self-perpetuating system where the, the higher ranks and the more senior researchers dominate everything. And if you shift it, the additional benefit to a sort of evidence-based or quality, a codified quality system would mean you could call out more senior colleagues who actually aren't doing all that great research would have more power so that it feel it looks like good research, or they can they can silence criticism, and, and that would be a massive advantage because it would actually shift it from a social political power game to an actual game of where the argument wins out. I mean, my my, my biggest disappointment was my first international conference. You know, as a young PhD student, when I realized this was all about politics, I entered this because I thought the best argument would win, but this wasn't. It wasn't like that. It was it was more more the case that the the person with the best friends wins, you know, much like on a schoolyard, and 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 that was a big shock. And 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 you realise that there needs to be a fundamental uh, culture shift where the most senior person or the most senior colleague who makes a mistake admits to this and say, "Thank you for pointing this out." You know, I'll change whatever I, you know, my analysis or something or whatever, rather than again, I was laughed at by senior colleagues at the conference, and luckily. I had the goods to turn out to say, look, if you can explain my data, be my guest, and no one could. So um, that was just luck that I, you know, but normally, you know, this is, a, it's not, it's not a great culture that we very often have. And I think that's where the conversation needs to start. There's, there's a couple of papers that were posted earlier on in the chat around research culture. Um, one is from the Wellcome Trust, which if you haven't read it, is, a, is an excellent paper. Um, it's called um, Our Work Research Culture, I think. And there's another one posted from the Royal Society. Um, they are really good um, articles to start when you're thinking about your research culture journey. So I think there's two things here. I think one is around leading, leading the narrative in the conversation and, and being part of the MRI, that was actually the main focus of our project is we didn't want to be led into the research impact conversation. MRIs are subject to slightly different um, assessment processes than universities are we're not we're not beholden to era and nei um, we're not beholden to university rankings so we had a real opportunity to actually lead our sector through this conversation rather than waiting and being led by a funder or a government department or or the rest of the sector so i think that was a real privilege privilege um, i also think we need to learn by doing and learn by doing and sharing so there was a comment from i think lucia around um, impact statements and, and doing them and refining and reviewing them and I think also sharing them. Um, I think sharing sharing our learnings with the sector can only help improve the sector and I'm very much a, um, a proponent to the fact that we should all be sharing and collaborating when it comes to our assessment processes and our strategies and our engagement as much as we do in our research. Um, and I think we also just have to be mindful of, of perverse incentives in the back of our mind as we go through that. So I actually used to work in the law faculty at the University of Western Australia, Kimberley, and I, I remember that, that list of journals and I, I'm aware that it, that, it still, that it still exists. So these perverse kind of things that come into the sector and, and sort of nipping in the, them in the bud as early as you can and, and moving on for them, I think is a, is a really important thing. But I think there's a real opportunity. This is this has to be a big conversation. This has to be a conversation that, that the sector engages in within their organisations and across organisations. So opportunities like this to, to pose questions that people might be considering and sharing those ideas are actually really critical. Thanks, Tara. Um, so time is starting to catch up, but we do have the chat box. So if anyone has any other questions, you can still post them in there uh, while we wait. Uh, so this is to all the panel again. Uh, what do you think we can do on the individual, institutional and system level? And uh, what are the, what is maybe one lever of change? that we can pull that would maybe have a really 
big impact. Uh, Kimberly? Yeah, it's interesting because I think I think we've thrown a bunch of ideas at that particular wall. Um, I mean, if I were if I were to, you know, if if I were going to try and make an impact, it would be look, it would it would be both at the the kind of you know that like the faculty and the ADR level, as I said, like I think people need to be having these conversations with all of their, you know, mentees and junior researchers and helping everyone navigate these ideas, you know, the earlier the better, um, as Tara says, you know, people need guidance and to, just to help them think through what exactly they want to do and what's going to, what's going to work with everything else in their life as well, right? There is, you know, some kinds of research lend themselves better to, you know, if you need more flexible work arrangements, for example, you have caring responsibilities at different times in your career. Like there's a whole bunch of things. Um, because we don't, we, we have to recognise that we're also people and we're not superhuman. I mean, the other, the other thing I would say is that um, for all the reasons we've been articulating, including in this conversation and in some of the chat, I, the idea of actually kind of coming out and saying, a, like articulating what we think, you know, re good research, good impact can look like, um, would be would be helpful and, and sharing that across the disciplines as a I mean that would that would be my starting point. Yeah if I had a magic wand I would I would I would get that. If 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 we could if we could have all of a sudden you know criteria of quality that worked for each discipline for each field and everybody we were happy with this and trying to sort of aspire to those I think that would be the critical changer for me. That would be the game changer if, if we could achieve that. And it's a great candidate for a magical wand because I think it's going to be a long and tedious process. So if we had a magical wand, you could wave it and do it overnight. That would be awesome. Absolutely. Um, I have so many levers I want to pull. <laughs> and I guess this, this is part of my characteristic is I just want to pull as many as I can. I think a few things have come up. I think... Um, uh, you know, this the topic of this conversation is around open and Richard just put a really great comment in the in the box and I think we need to be open as much with the with the initiatives and strategies that we're putting in place as our and in our organizations and making sure that they, you know, that they align or intersect or take into consideration what others are doing, you know, at the same time so that we can learn best practice. I think that's really important. I think that the quality quantity debate needs to go on much further and we have that conversation internally, particularly when it comes to outputs. Um, you know, it's, it's great to say more and better, um, but I think more, more can lead to perverse kind of behaviours within teams. That goes then to research quality, which was some of the um, examples that Robert brought up in his own experience and I think building a strong research culture um, which is incredibly difficult in a sector which is forced to compete for finite resources and finite recognition and balancing this kind of compete collaborate um, sort of characteristics of the ecosystem are actually really important. Um, I think making sure that you're being aware of what's happening internationally is really important. So I'm a huge proponent of, of DORA um, and prescribe to that. The Leyden Manifesto for Research Metrics is pinned up on my wall and I refer to it often um, because it's, it's easy to slip back into what we know, what we've done, you know, for 10 years because we're time poor. Um, so there, I guess there's lots of levers there. What we can we do as individuals? We can do what Dion and Emma are doing and we can lead the conversation and we can be part of the conversation and, and we can open up the floor to other people. Um, so I'm, I'm actually excited. I think this is a great time to be part of the sector. I think th that the EMCRs, you have a real opportunity to help drive what's going to be the flavour and focus of the next 10 years um, and happy to, to join the ride with you. Thank you, Tara and Robert and Kim. Uh, I think uh, one of the overall themes of today has been really about looking at the way each discipline does work and how it should work, and then trying to really articulate that and really narrow down exactly what it is that make, makes each uh, discipline tick, and hopefully we can uh, 
make these things a lot better and more robust and actually more efficient and even more innovative. And I think that in society at the moment, due to things like COVID, uh, there were already cracks that were showing, but they really, uh, COVID has really um, brought them into focus. And what's becoming even more apparent is that the status quo uh, isn't really working to tackle the big challenges that we face at the moment. And so on the one hand, while those challenges are daunting, I think we have an amazing opportunity to actually use this time to uh, create change that is meaningful and uh, impactful part of the time. Uh, and just to make research much more rewarding, fulfilling, and uh, more innovative. Um, Emma, uh, what are your thoughts? I've been um, just really energised to be part of this conversation, and I know we've had some really good comments coming through um, the chat as well around uh, the complexities around bias, also around being interdisciplinary. And I think this is something that we're finding that we are working in larger teams now. Um, the humanities is part of STEM in my world. And that has really shifted the way that a lot of people who have been focused on the quantitative um, metrics are now shifting to qualitative. And there's such power in being able to speak in those languages. Um, I think Dion raises a, a good, you know, that there is a push right now. Uh, we've all seen the, the cracks in our society on our, on our front doorsteps. And so this is a really important conversation. And I, I would urge everybody who stayed with us for the session to actually continue this conversation, not just with their colleagues and peers, but to rock the boat and to, to challenge institutions um, and to make this a conversation that uh, is, is both bottom up as well as top down. Um, because it is really, I think that the guts of why it's important is because it is a values conversation. And I know Robert, you you mentioned this and Tara and Kim, you, we, this all came up um, because it actually a research assessment is the gateway to who gets to contribute their thinking. Um, and it also is what prioritizes what our society deems important. And this is really personal to all of us. It's really critical for us to act as a whole. Um, and I, I urge people to get involved in this conversation, whatever way uh, suits you. So if you're a Twitter, if you're a Twitter or a tweeter, um, get online and contribute using the hashtag. Um, or if you prefer to call up a friend, do that. Um, so I just want to pass on to the organisers to to finalise today's session. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to thank Tara, Kimberly, and, and Robert for your insights. Um, and for energising us all to, to get this conversation going in every aspect of our academic lives. Thank you. Thanks for organising this. Thank you. Thank you, Emma and Dion. Um, just to wrap up, I'd like to thank the panellists, Kimberly Weatherall, Robert Malhammer and Tara McLaren for their time and insights. And a reminder to everyone that the recordings will be made available if you want to share these with your colleagues. Um, this afternoon's session will be an open access escape room, so please join us if you have pre-registered. And tomorrow's sessions will be an open on open uh, across the spectrum, sorry, open across the research spectrum and how to address global challenges with open science. So please visit our website where you can see the full program and register. And thank you all for attending and enjoy the rest of Open Access Week.